All right, so Shauna, you're like a PhD, you're a psychologist, you're a best-selling author. You've got a lot going for you, but even you have struggled with with feelings of doubt and unworthiness. Am I right? Is this where this book Absolutely. comes from? <laughs> uh, yeah, no, it's something I've struggled with a long time. And what was, I think, a breakthrough moment for me was realizing that I wasn't alone in that, that it's the sense of kind of self-doubt or self-judgment is somewhat universal. And um, what was interesting is when I became a clinical psychologist, and I started working with lots of different patients and clients and people from very different walks of life. You know, I worked at the Veterans Hospital. I worked with women with breast cancer. I worked with stressed out college students and stressed out parents and high level executives. And everyone was talking about the same thing, right? This tremendous mm. kind of self-doubt. And so I started studying, you know, self doubt and really shame is what I was interested. Like, does it help? Like, does it help you become a better mother? Does it help you lose weight? Does it help you exercise more? And what is so fascinating is that no, it doesn't, you know, that, that when we shame and judge ourselves, it actually shuts down the learning centers of the brain. So it keeps mm -hmm. us stuck in repeating the same, you know, unhealthy habits or behaviors or patterns. And that self-compassion is this very surprising kind of antidote, you know, or alternative that, that when we treat ourselves with kindness, it actually both soothes our kind of stressful, painful moment and turns on the learning and motivation centers of the brain that kind of gives us the resources we need to change. And so it's almost like the opposite of what you would think. Like instead of pushing yourself and trying harder, you actually need to take care of yourself and treat yourself like you treated dear friend. Yes, yes. And it's funny how it's like so difficult in our culture. Like I think that it's really, and I'm really curious about what it's like in other cultures too, because like at least like in the United States, right? Like it's sort of you know, founded in this Judeo-Christian kind of like judgment culture, right? Like there's like that, that it was a tool, guilt and shame. But mm -hmm. it, it, do you know if it's the same, I mean, oh, universally for all humans? <laughs> It's been interesting. There have been cross-cultural studies and it, there is this sense of kind of shame and guilt. It looks different in different cultures, especially kind of individual cultures versus collectivist cu cultures. But, but the sense of shame and guilt and not enoughness seems to be universal. And, mm -hmm. and, and I want to be really clear that, you know, remorse you know, kind mm. of healthy shame, you know, not toxic mm. shame, I think is important. It's important for us to recognize when we've made mistakes, to feel the pain of it that motivates us to change. But mm. what happens is we tend to get stuck in the pain and then it kind of takes all our energy away from healing or changing and sucks it into the shame. And, mm. you know, I'll, I'll give you an example that, that happened recently is, is, um, my son is at boarding school right now, which for me is, is really hard because I miss him a ton. And he was home visiting and I was so excited and I wanted everything to be perfect and I was trying to do everything right. And um, I something happened. I don't remember. I was in the kitchen when I was cooking and that's always a stressful place for me. <laughs> and I kind of snapped at him or I did something wrong. And he was like, whatever. And he walked into his room. And I remember sitting there and just feeling like, oh my God, this is like my one chance to reconnect with my son. And I've missed him so much. And I've like waited for this moment and God, I'm a terrible mom. And like, why did, you know, and I was just the, like all this shame and all this self-judgment. And then, you know, luckily I've been studying this stuff for like 25 years. So I was like, wait a minute, this isn't helping him or me, right? It's just keeping me stuck here. I'd rather use my energy to reconnect with him. But before I could do that, I had to take a moment and be like, oh, sweetheart, you feel really sad and disappointed. This wasn't how you wanted your first dinner to go. And that moment of compassion kind of woke me up and allowed me then to go into his room and breathe a little more slowly and deeply and, and connect in the way that I'd wanted to. Yeah. I mean, to me, it makes so much sense. Like if you were going to be harsh and mean to ourselves, when we're not going to be able to pick ourselves up and move on and, and try new things and learn new things more easily because we're going to be afraid of like that inner voice, right? But if we are kind to ourselves, 
then it's like, okay, you know, if we're soothing ourselves, then we're like able to just pick up and start again. And that's, I mean, it's like a series of beginning anew again and again and again. I mean, that's what life is. That's what mindfulness is. I mean, that's what, that that's how we grow and learn is just, we start again and we start again and start again. That gives us that ability to do that. Yeah. I love, I love that you just said that about beginning again, because for me, that's like one of the greatest gifts of mindfulness and self-compassion is this capacity to begin again, to recognize that this is a new moment that we can start afresh. And, and I think for a lot of people, they feel stuck. They feel like it's too late or I've made too many mistakes or I can't change. And I think for me, one of the most hopeful messages is neuroplasticity. This, Mm -hmm. this, discovery really that that our brain is always changing that it's never too late that you're never stuck no matter how old you are no matter what mistakes you've made all of us have the capacity to to literally re-architect the very structure of our brain so this is beautiful and so hopeful and i love it and so well let's talk about how we do that and you your latest book uh, good morning i love you there was a person in your life who made this suggestion right to 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 greet yourself in the morning like this can you tell us the story about that yeah so this was many years ago um it was actually when i was going through a very difficult divorce and I would wake up every morning with this pit of shame in my stomach. I was, I felt, you know, really literally sick from the divorce and terrified it was going to ruin our son's life. And my meditation teacher suggested I start practicing more self-compassion. And she said, I want you to try saying, I love you, Shauna, every day. And I was like, no way. <laughs> it, just felt, it just felt so contrived and inauthentic. And I'm like, I'm sitting here hating myself. I'm not going to say I love you. She, she saw my hesitation and she said, how about if you just say good morning, Shauna, right? Just, just greet yourself with kindness instead of like, you know, slapping yourself down first thing in the morning. And so the next morning I woke up, I put my hand on my heart, which is what she had suggested because it releases oxytocin, which is kind of the soothing love hormone. So I put my hand on my heart, Mm -hmm. took a breath, said, good morning, Shauna. And it was kind of nice, right? Instead of the avalanche of fear and shame and judgment, I just, there was this flash of kindness. So I kept doing it and I practiced for a couple, it was actually a couple of months went by and it was my birthday. And my son was with his father at a long planned family trip. And so I was alone. And it was probably my first birthday in my whole life I've ever been completely alone. And I remember um, waking up and I put my hand on my heart to do my good morning practice. And this image of my grandmother came to me and Mm. she had passed a few years before and she was really my person. So this image of Nana comes to me and I just felt her love. And before I knew it, I said, good morning. I love you, Shauna. Mm. And I felt it. It was as if the dam around my heart burst and this like flood of love came pouring in. And, you know, I wish I could say every day since then has been this bubble of self-love and that's not true. But what is true is that pathway of self-kindness, of self-compassion was established and it continues to grow every day that I do the practice. You know, some days I do it and it feels awkward and some days I do it and I don't feel anything, but some days I do it and I feel this profound sense of love of, of actually being on my own team which is radical, right? Normally we, we're, we're our own worst enemy instead of actually supporting ourselves, which is what makes sense. And did you see this? I mean, obviously you're going through an incredibly difficult time. You're going through a divorce and all this change, but did you see, I mean, I, I guess I, I had a similar practice that I was suggested to me by somebody that was, uh, you know, just may I love and accept myself exactly as I am. And look in the mirror and mm-hmm. say, may I love and accept myself exactly as I am. And I practiced that. I said it to myself five times every day <laughs> in the mirror. And and to me, for me, this practice, along with, you know, my meditation practice and things like it, it became something that transformed the way I was in the world, you know, and mm-hmm. trans- allowed me to be in the world in a way where I could... I could just be more relaxed, be clearer with others, step into mm-hmm. some th- 
roles and things that were a little scarier, you know, that, that I would have held myself back from before. So I'm just wondering if something similar yeah. happened for you as far as like, what, how did this practice affect you? Yeah, I love that question. And gosh, in so many different ways. And I, I think the first thing you said that's really important is it does give you a little bit more courage to take mm -hmm. risks or to be in difficult situations because you know that you have your own back. Like there's there's this sense mm -hmm. of support. Um, so I think that definitely it gave me a bit more confidence. Um, the other kind of unexpected but really profound change for me was I started to feel more kind of at home in myself. Like I was building a home within myself, this safe place from which to explore the world. And I think developing this self-love is really what allowed me to meet my current husband. That I remember when I met him and it was many, you know, eight, nine years after my divorce, but it was like this recognition of that safe place of like that sense of, oh, that's what love feels like is Hmm. is the sense of safety, which I think up until that point, love had felt a little bit more tumultuous or a little bit. And it was probably because that's also how I treated myself. And, and so for me, one of the most profound shifts was just learning how to love myself somehow allowed me to kind of find true love in partnership. And, hmm. um, you know, it's kind of unexpected. And, and, and it, it, I've, I've been thinking about it a lot recently, because um, I remember when I got divorced, I went to visit my grandparents. They were still alive um, right when I got divorced. And I asked my nana, I said, how do you do it? Because she and my grandpa were married 70 years, like in the most deep, true, passionate love you've ever seen. And she said, self-love. Mm -hmm. And I remember looking at her like, what are you talking about? Because I saw how generous they were with each other. It didn't look like self-love. It looked like lots of other love. Um but she really, you know, I think she really embodied the sense that they both came from a, a wellspring of love for themselves. And that's how they kind of created this love, you know, between each other. That's really interesting. I mean, for me, and that taps into something like I, I, the idea of, I, I remember when I, my, the first person I really fell in love with um, when I was like 18 years old and the, having this recognition that um, when I'm with you, because you love me so much, I love me so much. Like it, there was like this mm. self-love aspect of like, oh, I, and I hadn't felt that, you know, before it was just this remarkable mm. feeling. So I think that really makes a lot of sense somehow. And I'm not sure, quite sure I'm connecting the, the full dots in my head yet with this, but, um, I'm going to be thinking about it. It's really fascinating. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. Um, I love that. And so self-love is uh, the wisdom of Nona, right? It's like the self-love is like part of that ability to give lasting love and to be that. You know, it's interesting when I think about this, like in some ways, like we talked about neuroplasticity and, and it, you know, we know, you know, we that we have the negativity bias. We know that, you know, our brains are kind of primed for negativity and, so in a way, the practices of self-compassion, the practices of self-acceptance and the, all those things, they're, they're kind of like that whole idea of like good habits crowding out the bad, right? Like kind of like when you're trying to eat better, you're just supposed to eat a lot more vegetables and not worry about so much about not eating the bad things, quote unquote bad things, mm -hmm. but you're supposed to use those good habits to sort of crowd out the bad. Would you say like a self-compassion yeah. practice is a similar way? It's a really good point you're making. So the, what people don't really understand about neuroplasticity is it's not like a one-time thing that instantly lights up the good and shuts out the bad. It's it's over time practicing different pathways. And as you practice these new healthy pathways of self-love or self-compassion or even of gratitude and focusing on the beauty and the good in the world, it starts to prune away the old unhealthy pathways. And mm -hmm. so you're exactly right that, that there's this kind of, you almost get like, you know, double for every time you're practicing self-love, you're also pruning self-judgment. Every time you focus on gratitude, you're pruning away, you know, anxiety. And so I think for, for what people don't understand about neuroplasticity is it's really more of a direction than a destination. It's about kind of carving out these new pathways. Um, and it begins with intention. So 
between age zero and 25, neuroplasticity is kind of happening all the time. You don't even have to try. You're just like a sponge and you're learning for the good or for the bad, right? We, you know, early childhood experiences, you know, unfortunately for those who have had really difficult ones, they shape you, um, but also for the good. And we can learn many languages. We can do many different things that are extraordinary. Around age 25, I mean, not right on your birthday, but, but around then <laughs> it really slows down. And you have to be more intentional. And that neuroplasticity actually has to be, um, it can't be passive anymore. It has to be active. And so the only way to engage neuroplasticity, what we're talking about is positive neuroplasticity, mm -hmm. changing the brain for the good. Um, you can still you know, have trauma later in life and immediately have neuroplasticity for the bad, but changing the brain for the good requires intention. It requires making a conscious choice for example, I want to cultivate more self-love. When you set an intention and it's authentic, it can't be fake. When it's authentic, what happens, you know, a lot of people think intentions are like these spiritual psychological things. They're neurochemical. So when you set an intention, you release dopamine. And what dopamine does is it kind of stamps down. It says to your brain and your nervous system, this is important. And then what happens is the dopamine transforms into a whole cascade of events, including norepinephrine and adrenaline, which focus you, get your attention focused. And so all of a sudden you have like all your resources working on whatever project it is, in this case, self-love. And so what I tell people when they say, well, where do I start? Um, is really just even just setting that intention, setting that kind of compass of your heart in the direction of self-kindness and self-love of just practicing even 5% more being on your own team. Yeah, maybe something like, um, may I have more self-compassion, right? Like some uh, that might be like a baby mm -hmm. step to say, may I have more self-compassion just to set that intention. I love that the uh, idea that intention is neurochemical. Like that's so cool. You know, you've got that science behind yeah. it to sort and of And I love that you said may I because – yeah, no, I, well, and it, it's not like we're lying to ourselves. It's not like we're like, I love myself. I love myself. You know, it's kind of yeah, like yeah, that, yeah. you know, Saturday Night Live skit. It's, it's just like, may I, like, may I move in that direction? That's, that's my deepest intention or prayer or, you know, this, this is my hope, my aspiration. And just by setting that, you know, they did a research study just by setting the intention to be happier. Eight weeks later, people were happier. Oh, you're, wow. you're, you're setting in motion this whole cascade of neurochemistry to support you. Wow. And what's also interesting, if you think about it, is what this means is you can't, once someone's over 25, you can't change them unless they want to change. Mm -hmm. Right. So sorry, but for all these spouses out there, they're like, oh, I'm going to make him do this or make him do that. Unless someone sets that intention, makes, brings it into conscious awareness, they're not going to change. Mm, yeah, yeah. You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink proves to be a, a very lasting and, and truthful statement. Okay, cool. So this is, it's interesting because seeing sort of that marker of zero to 25, right? The brain developing and that absorption. I mean, it shows us also like as parents, like how much you know, impact and influence we have, you know, there's always the question of nature versus nurture, but there's a lot of impact and influence that we can have as our, our kids are sponges, like absorbing all of yeah. these things. And, and they absorb the unhealthy things too. And we have to recognize that, you know, as far as sort of those things that come through, one of the things that, comes through, I think, in a lot of ways that we can't really help is that inner voice, even though we don't realize it, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's going to kind of sort of come out. Our kids absorb it at some point along those 18 or 25 years, right? They're going to absorb that, that voice. Right. Um, and can you imagine, can you imagine if instead what you modeled for them was like, let's say you make a mistake instead of being like, you idiot, that you said, mm -hmm. oh, sweetheart, darn, you know, that was really upsetting. Like if you modeled treating yourself with kindness that that would just naturally that's like oh that's what you do when you make a mistake instead of berating yourself you support yourself that makes sense i mean it actually does and so then your children have this model that you know i remember when my dad used to get upset he would close his eyes and take a deep breath 
And I remember going out in the world and that's what I would do. And like, I would get teased and I didn't realize that that wasn't everyone's response when they were stressed, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think that as parents, we have to be really intentional about what we model, how we live and also what we teach our children. And, you know, I've been thinking a lot about it. I, I kind of wish that I had specialized in, in childhood development instead of adults, because, you know, after learning <laughs> about the zero to 25 window, I'm like, God, I'm working so hard to help people change after age 25. I wish I'd just gotten in there early. And if there was one thing that I would want parents to teach their children, and one thing that I'm really working on teaching our children is, is this ability to pause you know, in between whatever the stimulus is and whatever the reaction or response is, this ability to pause and have this mindful moment where we're, we're able to choose our response. And I think that pause, in that pause could come a lot of, of compassion where mm -hmm. normally, you know, something difficult happens and we just immediately react. Um, if we could create this space, I think it would heal so much in our world. Yeah, I mean, then we could choose a tool, right? Like we could choose a tool like self-compassion. We could choose mm -hmm. to put a hand to the heart. We could choose to step out of the way and take a break, right? Like we could choose a lot of different things. It's that is essential for that choice. And it's interesting, right? Like, because, but you know, we have to be intentional, right? 25 and up, we're generally, <laughs> as parents, most of us are 25 and up. So, I mean, a lot of us are anyway, a lot of the listeners are, I assume. And we've got to make that choice to say, okay, mm -hmm. I want to pause, you know, just like as if we want to, this self-compassion thing is, um, I, I think of it as like a muscle. I love the metaphor of like a yeah. muscle, right? That we're building, mm -hmm. you know, it's a pathway that you're building that you're, you're kind of, you know, you're bushwhacking and then you're making the path smooth <laughs> and then you're doing all the things. And, and the pause can be the same way, right? Like it can be something that, you know, maybe dear listener for the next two weeks, you say, I'm going to just practice pausing before I respond, even in good moments, right? Even in like chill moments, even if, no you know, nothing's crazy is happening just to give myself uh, that ability, right? So I'm not yes. always in reactive mode. So it, it's like a thing that we can practice to then give ourselves the ability yes. to do a bunch of other things. I love, and I love how you just said that. So, so first of all, my favorite phrase in the whole world is what you practice grows stronger. Mm -hmm. So you need to practice the pause. Like that's been one of my mottos for a long time, practice the pause. That's an incredible. And then what I love is you, you, you said you, this kind of bushwhacking, like you're, you're cultivating this new pathway. So in my book, I talk about how we have these super highways of habit, right? Our reactivity, our judgment, our impatience. And what we're doing is we're carving out these little country roads of compassion. And we're literally having to bushwhack like through, you know, it, it's not as fast. It's not as comfortable. It's not as natural, perhaps. But just like you said, over time, you can prune away the superhighway and you can carve out this new pathway of pausing or compassion or gratitude. Okay, so we wanna we wanna want those good habits, right? We wanna start some of these good habits to sort of crowd out the bad. Mm -hmm. You talked about like that pruning away, like we are pruning away the unhealthy pathways. But yeah. as we, you know, we're human, right? And we have negativity bias, and all of those things are sort of like natural, right? Like we're sort of more naturally anxious and on the lookout for threats than we are relaxed, right? So these things pop up. Do when do you suggest people start to like maybe, or, or how do people start to sort of prune away some of those unhealthy thoughts or deal with some of those unhealthy things mm -hmm. that are like eating away at the, at the self-love and self-compassion? Yeah. So I, I love, first of all, and what you said is so important. It is natural to be anxious and on the lookout for danger. That is how you evolved. The negativity bias is evolutionarily. It's essential, right? We, we evolved from people who were scanning their environment for danger. They weren't the ones when they heard the rustle in the bushes that were like, oh, let me see if I can pet that pretty kitty, right? They were <laughs> like, whoa, lion, I'm out of here. Okay, so that's who we evolved from. So. I Thank think you, ancestors. Is, right. <laughs> but the first step is when you feel anxious, instead of saying like, God, what's wrong with you? Why are you anxious? Or you're the only one who feels scared. 
to actually just name it just, oh, sweetheart, you feel scared. When we name an emotion, what's so fascinating, this was a study from UCLA, they found that it actually puts the brakes on our physiology and starts to calm us down. So just naming an emotion is, is the first step. The second step um, is really practice over and over again. You can't just hear us say this. You can't just read about it. You actually have to practice. This is literally how you carve out these new pathways. And so the reason why I wrote my, my most recent book that just came out last week is that it's a guided journal and it takes people um, every day on these science-based practices in just five minutes a day, because I realize especially parents are busy. I now have four teenagers, so I understand <laughs> what it means to be busy. But what I realized as a scientist is if you want to change, you have to practice. You can't just read about it. And so my first book, Good Morning, I Love You, was a wonderful introduction. And I think it started a lot of people on a path. But this next book is really the practice. This is how you mm. actually re-architect your brain. And there's no real shortcuts. But the goal isn't perfection either, right? The goal is just practice so that we can keep growing. So what are some, can you share some of the practices that you have in the guided journal that are, that help people practice this? Absolutely. So it's, it's actually a three month journey and I've been so excited about it because it's really, I took kind of everything I've learned in the last 20 years, both, you know, in the laboratory and as a professor, but also in the monasteries of Thailand and Nepal and in all the meditation retreats I've done and just took kind of the best science-based practices. And so they include things like a gratitude practice, which is incredibly important, um, self-compassion practice, um, which we've been talking a lot about. And to give an example of self-compassion practice, mm, so mm -hmm. one, one practice is to imagine something you're struggling with, you know, to think about, you know, maybe you're struggling with finances or maybe you're having trouble sleeping or maybe with your children or whatever it is. And then to write yourself a letter as if it was your best friend who was struggling, not you. So if your very best friend who you love so much, if you saw her struggling with her, her daughter, what would you say to her? How would you support her? How would you comfort her? What would you guide her? And it sounds simple, but when you do it, it's like this radical rotation of consciousness. And I want to be clear. You can't imagine what your friend would say to you. That does not work because then you're like, yeah, yeah, of course she's being nice. Like it, you, it doesn't change your consciousness. <laughs> what changes is let's say I think of my very best friend, Annie, and I imagine that Annie is struggling with, with in the same way I'm struggling with my son. And I, I kind of imagine, you know, what would I say to Anne? And I know how much Anne loves her children and loves being a mother. So I would tell her all those things. And I, I literally just immediately feel compassion, immediately feel love. But when I try to do it to myself, it's not so easy. And so this little kind of, I don't like the word hack, but this little tool mm. really helps people shift. So that's one example. Um, another, I just yeah. want to point out here that that's also, you know, what Sean is sharing is backed up by science. We recently had uh, the author of Chatter. Oh, I'm going to forget his name. Oh yeah. Ethan Cross who talked about this idea about the studies that have backed the idea of like talking to yourself in the third person and how that really yes. sort of shifts us, our, our attention and shifts our perspective and helps us to see more clearly. And so uh, mm -hmm. I just want to point that out there for the listener that there's a, a lot behind that. Go ahead, Sean. That's great. Thank you, Hunter. Yes. And, and, and I will say, you know, I mean, I became a professor and got my PhD because I believe in the science. And, and so every single practice in the book is based in science. If there wasn't science behind it, then I didn't include it. Um, we also have practices for cultivating joy because, you know, you and I have spoken a lot about the negativity bias and it's real, you know, it's, we are hardwired to look for the negative. And so learning how to cultivate joy is incredibly important. And one of the things that I find so fascinating is that we tend to kind of gloss over pleasant experiences because we're scanning for the danger. Mm. And it takes about 20 to 30 seconds to encode something into your long-term memory. And so one of the practices is to really practice, like let's say you're eating a piece of chocolate or something delicious, to pause for the 20 to 30 seconds and actually let that positive experience 
be encoded into your long-term memory, which becomes part of your chemical soup. You don't want all your memories to be negative. So you actually have to kind of encode in some beautiful ones. And when you start to savor the chocolate and you smell it and you taste it and you feel the way it kind of begins to melt, each one of those um, sensory you know, uh, experiences serves as like a tiny hook into memory. So it helps like anchor it in. And so in the journal, I teach people kind of very simple practices that don't take a lot of time, but help to shift them into a state of greater joy and greater gratitude um, that will continue, not just in that moment, but continue to carve out the pathway. That's beautiful. So what I'm hearing in these practices is attention. And Mm. it's so interesting because I think about our world And I think about that like little computer in my pocket that takes way too much of my attention. It really drives me crazy how much I have to grab it or look at or touch it. And, you know, and other people expect me to see these messages, you know, whatever it is like, and then I get sucked into something else. Right. And like this, the, the way our world is with our smartphones today taking our attention and fragmenting it and fragmenting it and fragmenting it. And it, yeah. what you're describing is about mindfulness, right? Is about attention is about really yes. being present with what is right. Like if we're going to be able to mm-hmm. really enjoy that moment, we have to be able to slow down and give it attention. Right. So it can encode in, but I, I, I feel like a lot of us are just getting Law, our, our attention is being fragmented and lost and distracted yeah. like exponentially these days. It's, I mean, yeah. I don't know. Are you seeing that feeling that and with your clients or yourself? Absolutely. Or- and, and I, I already gave you my favorite phrase, which is what you practice grows stronger. But my mm. second favorite phrase is that attention is our most valuable resource. Mm. It's not time. It's not money. It's your attention where you put your attention becomes your life. And as you're pointing out so beautifully, we tend to have very reactive attention. Like our smartphone rings and we react. We don't, we don't choose intentionally where we put our attention. And that's really the goal of this journal is to put people back in choice and to say, how do you want to spend your time? And more importantly, where do you want to put your attention? And to teach you to focus your attention because it's a muscle and you can develop it. And one of the practices in the book is developing your mindfulness, your ability to see clearly and pay attention instead of going through life on automatic pilot where you're just, you're reacting. You're like a ping pong ball instead of being in choice. Yeah. Beautiful. So how do you practice that personally, right? Like retaining your attention. How do you, you know, you said you have teenagers, you have a busy life, you have a practice. I know what it's like to be an author and to write the book, you know, like there's a lot of demands on your time. How do you, Mm -hmm. how do you practice that personally today? Yeah. So a couple different ways. Um, one, I, for me, my morning practice is very, very important. And so unless it's an emergency, that's kind of my anchor. And, and I'll explain why morning is such an important time. So first of all, when we wake up, we're in, our brain is in a theta state, which is very trainable. It's very suggestible. And so it's a really important time instead of reaching for your smartphone or looking at the news or all the things you have to do that day, it's a really important time to protect the mind and kind of train your attention, train your clarity, and also set your intention for the day to really orient yourself. Okay. So that's the first thing. The, well, the very first thing I do while I'm still lying in bed is I do the, the good morning, I love you practice. And I really encourage people to try it. Um, even if you can just put your hand on your heart first thing in the morning and just kind of bring that love and attention to yourself, it sets the trajectory of the day in a different way. So that's that's first. And then I'll sit for for a period of time to kind of to gather. And I think for me, it's really important to kind of bookend my day. So I'll start with that. And then at the end of the day, then in the night is when I'll do my loving kindness practice. And that again, is very short. And I'll just kind of go through all the people that I love that kind of pop into my mind and all the kids and my parents and my in-laws and, and also just, you know, you know, patients I'm working with students I'm working with, whoever's just kind of 
touched me that day and I'll just send them my loving kindness. May you be peaceful. May you be happy. May you be healthy. And especially during pandemic, I found this practice incredibly helpful that for so much of the time, um, you know, I couldn't see a lot of my friends and family and was really missing them. And this was a way instead of missing them where I could just connect with them and feel my love for them. Mm -hmm. And I think that, um, is really important. I think a lot of times when we miss people or we're worried about them, and I think especially for parents, you know, this is very relevant. We tend to feel the pain of the miss or the pain of the fear. So if my son is struggling, I almost have this like empathic, you know, resonance where I'm in pain too. Right. And any parent knows that when you see your kid, even if they hurt themselves, it's the, you're, the pain you feel is real. But what research shows is that when we empathize with someone's pain, it lights up the pain centers of our brain. Well, you can imagine over time that would kind of burn you out. Yeah. <laughs> so the key is not to distance or separate. You still want to feel what someone else is feeling. But the key is to drop down to compassion, which mm-hmm. is your care and your desire to help. And what's so fascinating, and this was done at University of Switzerland, is that when you put people on brain scanners and and they feel compassion, the neural circuits of joy and positivity light up in the brain. Mm -hmm. When they feel empathy, the pain centers light up. So what the loving kindness practice helped me do so much is even for family members or friends who were struggling, I could focus on my love for them and on my deep and pure desire to help and send loving kindness. And that kind of one helped me feel stay connected, but two helped me not burn out and get overwhelmed by the amount of suffering in the world. That's it's so fascinating that difference between empathy and compassion. It's so interesting to to think about, and it, and of right. course, like both are are useful. But it reminds me of um, like uh, the Lisa Feldman Barrett talking about sort of the emotions mm-hmm. and how they you know, track between sort of positive and negative and then, and then high uh, intensity affect versus, you know, slow, calm intensity affect. And that, that kind of makes me imagine that empathy and compassion are kind of like in that similar, like they're just in that on versus that positive negative divide, right? Like there, there's a very similar vibe to both of them, but that's crazy that the empathy triggers our pain centers where, I mean, that's fascinating. Empathy empathy is kind of, it's a gateway to compassion, right? You have to Mm. know someone's in pain before you can, can, you know, feel the compassion. So empathy is not bad, which I appreciate that it's not, we're not saying bad or good. We're just saying, this is what happens when you feel it. And you don't kind of want to get stuck in empathy. You want to use it as a doorway into compassion. And I think for parents, you know, this is so important because when we get all riled up, when our kid's in pain and then we're like, oh my God, oh my God it doesn't soothe them, nor does it soothe ourselves. When we feel compassion for them though, it actually calms us down and we're able to give our best selves. So for me as a professor training therapists, this is one of the most important things I teach them, right? Is the difference between empathy and compassion. And really that compassion is like this protective suit, right? I say, you never want to distance, you know, we were taught so much in the medical profession, you know, keep distant from your patients. You never want to care too much. I understand where they were going with it, but it wasn't the right direction that mm-hmm. really you want to actually lean in deeper and, and feel your love and your care for them. And that's, what's protective. Mm. Yeah. It's interesting. And it's like, yeah, going through empathy into compassion. I love that. You know, so it's not like, it's not like we're robots. We're not unfeeling, we're feeling, and then we're moving to the, to the, that open space of, compassion and and may you be may you be well may you be peaceful may you be healthy etc that's so beautiful um wow so i love all this i love i think it's so important that we talk about this all the time because there's so many who struggle with um harsh inner critic harsh self voice um i think that's really real. And I know a lot of people feel that is there, that is, they're really stuck with that. Right. And, and what you're Mm -hmm. offering is that that is not true, that you are not stuck with it. That you have some choices, you have some ways to grow. You have some, that neuroplasticity. Um, 
to change this, which is beautiful. So I just would like to like end with like how for, for parents who are like, I want to give everything to my child. I just, maybe we can underline how is this practice? How is this self-compassion practice helping parents with their relationship with their child? Yes. That's such a great question because I think as parents, we do, we feel like we want to give everything to our children and we almost feel selfish when we Mm -hmm. practice self-compassion or like, or I don't deserve it, or I don't need it, or I shouldn't take this time. I'll start with the research as I always do. What the research shows is that parents who identify as more compassionate with themselves are rated as more compassionate by their children, by their spouses, and by their friends. So Mm. when you're compassionate with yourself, it actually is, it makes sense. You're strengthening that compassion muscle. You're able to give it out. So the first thing I would say is you're never just practicing for yourself, that everything you do ripples out into the world. And so when you practice self-compassion, it's actually cultivating greater compassion in this world. So that's the first thing. The second thing in terms of how to begin, there are three key steps to self-compassion and they're quite simple. And we've talked about the first two a lot. So the first one's mindfulness. The first thing is you just have to name your emotion. I'm scared. I'm angry. It's just being present with your own pain. And a lot of parents, we step right over that. So Mm -hmm. that's the first step. You slow down and you name I'm overwhelmed, whatever it is. The second step, you bring kindness to yourself. And again, that's radical. (laughs) You know, it's just so unusual for us to be on our own team. So that's number two. The third step, which for me has been the most transformational is what's called common humanity. So the third step is in that moment of pain or frustration or anger, we remind ourselves we're not alone. We remind ourselves, I'm not the only mom that just yelled at her kid, right? And then you think about all the other parents in the world who are struggling and you send your compassion out to them and then you breathe it back in for yourself. And there's this widening, right? Because normally when we're suffering, we think I'm the only one. We isolate in our pain. And this last part of self-compassion, it just expands to include everyone. And I remember when I was working with this this beautiful young mother with breast cancer, and we were doing a lot of self-compassion practice, but it wasn't really like landing for her. And it wasn't until we got to that third step where she thought of all the other women facing chemotherapy and facing surgery. And she started sending compassion out to them and then breathing it back in for herself where all of a sudden she's like, I'm not alone. And I still have this power and strength to be able to give compassion, not just feel like the victim, you know? Um, so for anyone who's wanting to start, and and this practice, of course, is in my book as well, but I think for me, that's one of the most powerful practices is, and it's, you can do it in 30 seconds. You know, you, you name your emotion with mindfulness, you bring kindness, and then you send it back out into the world. And you're like, okay, (laughs) back back to what I was doing. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I can begin anew now. I love Mm -hmm. that. I love that. Well, Shauna, thank you so much for sharing this, um, for the, the journal, putting this out in a way that, you know, is easy and accessible for people. It's really, really a wonderful thing to do. And, and thank you for your time and coming back on the Mindful Mama podcast. Mm-hmm. If I didn't mention it before, Shavana was on episode 100, way back in 2018. Um, you can go ahead and listen to that episode as well. But thank you so much for coming on. And where mm-hmm. can people find uh, out more about you if they want to continue learning? Yeah. So if you have any follow-up questions or you want to reach out, I always respond on my website, drshawnashapiro.com, or you can reach me on Instagram. It's at drshawnashapiro. Awesome. Thank you so much. Catch new episodes of the Mindful Mama podcast and other free resources, including the Mindful Mom Guide at mindfulmamamentor.com. You can listen to every back catalog episode, including interviews with Dr. Dan Siegel, Janla Van Zant, Sharon Salzberg, and get meditations, join our private Facebook group, and more. Go to mindfulmamamentor.com now. I'll see you there.